As always, I want to thank the Pardes Institute, P-A-R-D-S.org.il for helping to make this class happen. Okay, folks, here we are, class five of the Heralds of Zion series. We've looked at the religious roots of Zionism right, with Rav Kalisher and um, you know, I spoke about this sort of innovation, Rav Kalisher and, of course, Rav Alkali, and talked about that innovation of um, the natural path to redemption and how that itself was a chidush, was an innovation for religious Zionism. For the roots of religious Zionism, we talked about the tension between the cosmopolitan and the, the national, which is going to return to us today. That was in the person of Moshe Hess, who wrote really arguably the first nationalist tract, as well as being a collaborator with Marx and Engels in the early days of the communist movement. Um, then we moved on to Leon Pinsker, right? Pinsker, who really was the sort of first voice of political Zionism in that sort of vision of a mass return to territory. We spoke about the link between the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment, and some of the sort of assimilationist roots of emancipation and how that played in. And last, but certainly not least, last week we, um, we introduced Theodore Herzl and we spoke about why is it that Herzl merited to be called the father of Zionism if we can sort of like find all these other heralds. And I want to remind you that the two elements that I tried to push in conclusion um, were number one, his ability to capture the imagination. Right, um, he, both in his stature and charisma, uh, also in his timing, right? And, and that that's the, leads us to the second, which is there's something ineffable which is happening in the world as a whole at this point in history. And um, I had a discussion with someone here recently, or at least an email exchange about the difference between causality in history and uh, teleology in history. And it's one of the things that I, I wanna keep sort of squarely in view right now. Um, what's the difference? Causality in history goes all the way back to Herodotus, right? The, the Greek father of history and the idea that the purpose of a historian is to gather enough factual information in order to understand what makes what happened happen. What are the causes which we determine to be the drivers of the effects, right? The classic example is what, who started World War I, right? So I'm sure enough, there's enough education out there that the, the number of people might say, right, Gavrilo Princip, right, who was, of course, the, the Serbian assassin who killed Archduke Ferdinand, right? There was a single gunshot that literally killed tens of millions of people. At the same time, that's a little bit of a uh, facile answer to say that one gunshot started World War I, because when you start looking at the deeper causes, you can talk about the balance of power in Europe, you can, you know, talk about the tension between Germany and France, which had existed since the sort of the Franco-Prussian War, we could go quite far. So causality is a useful tool for understanding history, can unearth quite a bit. Another one for the Americans out there, if you ask someone what caused the Civil War in America, right? If you ask somebody in Boston what caused the Civil War, and you ask someone in Savannah, Georgia, what caused the Civil War, you're likely to get very different answers. And that leads us to one of the problematics of causality is that, that since there's an infinite frame, we could dig forever and unearth ever more sort of what are called proximal and distal causes near and far, then the decision of what is a true cause has more to do with me and my analytical frames than it has to do necessarily with the absolutes of history. So looking backwards is useful in understanding what caused Herzl. We spoke about the rising forces of nationalism, anti-Semitism as a political force as it was linked to that, right? The deterioration of the sort of uh, cultural structure within Western Europe, assimilation, acculturation, Right? Also the concentration in this sort of Hebrew Renaissance in Eastern Europe and the birth of a national consciousness, those are all certainly causes. But they're insufficient to explain why it is at the turn of the 20th century, there was an eruption of Jewish national spirit. And that offers us a sort of a, a different frame, which is teleology. Teleology is the perspective that, that um, a process is going somewhere. It has an end goal, a purpose, and therefore it's the purpose the end goal which defines the process as opposed to the origins and cause, right? And of course, you know, we as a people have a belief that there was a promise by God to Abraham that our national mission, nay, the mission of creation, if you go all the way with it, is bound up with the re-embodiment of the Jewish people in the land of Israel, which means that's a, a you know, from the divine perspective, it's an inevitable process. And what I want to look at today is not so much about the process and how it happens, but who do we need to be in order to make it happen? 
because one of the big bones I have to pick, I just did it actually myself. One of the big bones I have to pick with Jewish nationalists, and I consider myself one of them, is the confusion between Jewish and Israel. Because the Jew, as many of us had a chance to learn together over the course of the last two years, in many ways is a product of exile. Right? There are no Jews in the Torah. There are no Jews in the Bible until very late stage. You have Mordechai is the first person called Yehudi. He and Daniel really give birth to this idea of a Jew, which is a, a shrinking down and restructuring of the vision of Israel as conceived by the Torah. And so therefore, the quite natural sort of transposition of, well, we're the Jews, we talk about Jewish history, this is the Jewish story, right? I am, well, because the last 2,000 years we've been the Jews, don't misunderstand me, but the transposing of the Jews coming back to the land of Israel is a little bit, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'll go as far as say dangerous. It's a little bit dangerous because without the expansive vision of what it means to be Israel, the responsibilities and the obligations and uh, the nature of the relationship between Israel and the world as opposed to the Jews in the world, what you can end up with is a very narrow nationalist project, which uh, I mean, I'm not gonna you know, do the analysis for you guys here, but I personally believe that many of the challenges we face as both an internal society, as well as in our relationship to the world around us, has to do with the confusion of what it means to be Am Yisrael and the fact that we are the Jews. And are we doing the work to become more than we already are in order to merit to the great gift, as I see it, that we've received in being here. So that's a longer discussion, but I want you to keep it in mind because what we're going to talk about today, which is a somewhat long-winded introduction, is this concept of the new Jew. See, because we've spoken about personalities and the underlying sort of cultural, intellectual streams that heralded Zionism. Now I want to talk a little bit about the end goal, because what we're going to see today is that the return to Zion as a physical return is only one stream within the Zionist vision because it, for many, many of the Zionists, that return itself was linked and perhaps was even preceded or, or superseded by the vision of giving birth to a new Jew. That, that in order to be the people who would merit the land, we had to become something more, something other than what we were in exile. And that's what we're going to speak about today. If you're not familiar with it, by the time we're done, you'll see that you were actually familiar with it, even if you've never sort of heard that sort of like um, fun phrase, the new Jew. And we're going to do that primarily through the narrative once again. We're going to return to Herzl and a couple of the characters that I referenced briefly around him. But, but um, first, just a little bit more clarity. because. We're gonna, if you looked, if we sort of did a full course as opposed to this point by this point survey, we would have seen that the early Zionists found very little satisfaction in the new Judaism that was sort of growing in Europe in the day, whether it was in Western Europe in the reform movement or even in Eastern Europe in the sort of uh, Haskalah, the enlightened, the, the Zionists just, they, they felt that no matter how progressive or, or pluralistic or emancipated it was, it, there was something missing. What they wanted was a new Jew. And because of the pressures that they perceived, and remember, we, we've talked about how anti-Semitism is a growing driver for this story. And, and, and you know, whether we're going to talk about causality or not, I like to think of drivers. It is certainly a driver. One of the things that gives momentum to the Zionist stories, no question, is the rise of political anti-Semitism. And since we know the history, we know how the history of the Jews of Europe I don't want to say ended because there are still Jews in Europe. But let's say we know how it ended mid 20th century, right? And so therefore, it's, it wasn't an illusion in their minds that the pressure was on. And because the pressure was on, it's going to become a discussion of revolution as opposed to evolution, right? There's going, and, and, the, and the difference, if people have followed revolutionary movements throughout time, is that revolutionary movements have a tendency to be willing to sacrifice a lot of human beings for the sake of humanity. They tend to be idealistic movements, right? And in this case, Zionism is the re-embodiment of a nation. And therefore, the people are the material at hand for that project. And if you know a bit about the very difficult decisions that were made between the Zionist project and the Jews of Europe, particularly in the process leading up to the Holocaust, you might understand further how it could be that people who were avowedly committed to the survival of Am Yisrael, the Jewish people, might actually be willing to sacrifice Jews, particularly the Jews that don't fit the mold 
of what they felt would carry the story of the Jewish people into the next chapter of the future, right? And so now when we're talking about revolution, it's not just the sort of catastrophic and sort of an idealistic willingness to sacrifice. You guys understand what, how I'm using the word idealism there? In the sense that the, there is an ideal of what the Jew ought to be, and this Jew or that Jew, et cetera, may or may not match it. So therefore, I'm willing, right, to sacrifice in pursuit of the goal of creating the new Jew, a lot of the, the Jews themselves. Not necessarily pushing them off a cliff, but I might make hard decisions educationally, politically, socially, financially, which will, which will save a core that will be transformed and sacrifice what I deem to be the periphery. And I see someone commented in the chats here, racial nationalism that is coming in our story quite quickly. Um, so, okay. So we've seen the other element of the revolutionary personality, which is so it's important to remember that literally the word revolution means to come back around to where you were. Because though I say new Jew, there will always be an element of returning, as we say, the crown to its original glory. This sense that, that the, the revolutionary is actually fixing the problems which have accumulated over time. We're getting back to who we were always meant to be. We saw this in Chassidut, those of us who got to learn a little bit about it together, in the claim to be a return to the pathetic origins of Torah and in its sort of anti-clerical break with a lot of sort of the rabbinic structure, the classic element of Chassidut. You see it in Shabtai Tzvi's movement, where we first encountered this idea of shlilata galut, the negation of exile, that, that in order to really be redeemed, we don't have to just physically leave exile. We have to leave everything which exile has created within us. That's going to become a major pillar of, of Zionist thought and culture. We see it, we didn't have this full discussion, but you see it, if you look in the historical critical perspective, which underlined, underlies Jewish science and the reform movement, this idea of stripping away that which is ac accidental or incidental or just a reaction to historical circumstance to get to the purified Judaism, that was a big thing in sort of like Western intellectual Judaism that um, gave birth to the reform movement. Notice stripping away that which is a product of historical process and getting at the true essence. Um, we're gonna see it and we're gonna re-encounter it today in the Hebrew Renaissance, this idea that a return to the ability to express oneself in the mother tongue is an essential element of the revolution. So all of these elements are gonna be in the mix. Because the Zionists certainly saw um, the return to origin as the path to the future from Israel. I mean, classically, right? The return to origin physically. But what I want to speak about today is um, another element of reconstruction. We're going to hit the language today. We're going to hit a little bit about culture, but we're going to hit a third piece, which uh, Avram nodded to there in his racial nationalism comment, uh, a third piece of, of a reconstruction, almost of the physique of the Jewish people. And you guys may be familiar with a phrase which was quite um, popular at one time in understanding the mentality of the Ben-Gurion style Zionism, which was min ha-tanach el ha-palmach. Right, the Tanakh being of course the Hebrew Bible, the Palmach being the striking arm of the Haganah, the underground army which was representative of the sort of left labor movements of the early state, which became the backbone, of course, of the Tzavah Haganah Israel, the Israel Defense Force. But that phrase, min ha-tanach el ha from the Tanakh to the Palmach, means, and nothing in between. It's an idea that in order to sort of uh, move forward to the ability to exercise power once again as a people, to be a free people in our land, as, as Herzl phrased it, we have to return to our biblical origin, mighty warriors, re-embody it in modern guerrilla warfare, the Palmach, and we need to skip everything in between. And, and, and if we were gonna do a full sort of uh, analysis of that stream within Zionist thought, as opposed to just putting it on the board as part of our whole mosaic, so we could talk quite a bit about the impact that that has on literature, on what's known as Zionist historiography. Um, anybody here grow up in the Israeli school systems? Now, my kids are, are, are all born here, um, it, and it's shifting, but you can look that up until quite recently in the history of Israel, um, the, the, um, the frame for history was basically like classic 
biblical, and then like the Dreyfus trial onwards. The idea that there was a rich 2,000 year history in multiple countries, et cetera, was, was painted over at best, and usually, usually portrayed as just endless suffering and, and torture by the Goyim, so who wants to know about it anyway? And a question here is that, does that mean goodbye to the Tanakh? No, it's a good question. Doesn't when mean a Tanakh el Tanakh, doesn't mean goodbye to the Tanakh, but it means a framing of the Tanakh as a national physical history and a mythos, and not as the roots of religious rabbinic culture. It's a reclaiming of the Tanakh. People may or may not be familiar that many of the sort of foundational figures of this country, um, Ben Gurion, certainly, I mean, Begin was a much more traditional, but Ben Gurion famously had a Tanakh study group in his home with some of the greatest minds of the generation, which should not be dismissed, but the frame of it was what's called, uh, even in schools today, Tanakh the Gova Einayim. If people are familiar with this idea, that like you literally mean the Gove Nai means like looking at it eye to eye, as opposed to the religious posture of sacred text, it's like, no, we're going to come to this and we're just going to look at it like we look at any other book, which, in my humble opinion, actually has a lot of um, powerful insights which can be gained, but it has uh, some cultural complications for people who are really more of a product of the book than a book which is a product of us. So, this is the frame for the new Jew. First of all, it's a revolutionary movement, and that means in its idealism, its willingness to sacrifice what is toward what, what must be is quite high. And, and number two, it's a sense of coming back around to origin, which means it has to find a new relationship to everything which lies in between. And that relationship, maybe chuck it, maybe reprocess it, repackage it, but however it's going to be done, it's not going to be what I would call the evolutionary cumulative, which is that I am a product of all my experiences. It's going to be an idealistic attempt to, to strip away the past in order to create something new. Okay, you guys with me? Questions or comments on that frame before we jump into the narrative flow? You can either put them in the, uh, in the what's it called, into the, t uh, the, the chat there, or we can try the real way. Mike? Yes. Can you just repeat the phrase? You said they, you have to frame the Tanakh as what to get from Min HaTanach El HaPalmach. You have to phrase it, I would say, as a, as a national historical piece and also as like a mythos. Right? I mean, it doesn't have to be historical in the literal sense like these events happen, but like Greek mythology, these are our heroes. These are the archetypes, which again, that I'm not criticizing that viewpoint as one of several ways of relating to the Tanakh, but certainly you need to strip it of its sacred status. Um, other questions or clarifications before we move forward? Okay, so remember, the, the chat stream is there, I can see it. Um, okay, so back into our story. You remember, I think I commented to you, that, that Herzl's first pamphlet um, was The Jewish State, was published in, in 1895, and it was really a pamphlet, even though it did have a practical element to it, and it was published before the um, first Zionist Congress in Basel in 18. 97, I got it, Peter, um, but I practiced that. Um, but his true vision was the book Alt Neuland, the old new land. And in that you can already hear this need to come to new relationship between past and future, the old new land, right? Um, it was published in 1902. Published, of course, originally in German because that was the sort of sophisticated language of the time, plus it's what Herzl spoke. Um, amongst other things. Uh, it was actually, interestingly enough, uh, translated into Hebrew by uh, Nachum Sokolov, a, and the title in Hebrew was Tel Aviv, Hill of Spring, which is itself a quote from the book of Yechezkel, and that was the inspiration for the naming of the modern city Tel Aviv. Um, but, but Old Neuland is a utopian novel. It's, a, it's fictional, it's, like a, it's, got a, it's actually a novel structure. I'm not gonna go into the analysis of the book, if you haven't read it, it's, it's worth reading. It's not actually, in my opinion, so well written, but that's its own issue. It is certainly an important uh, historical piece. But, but what's important for us is that it presents a vision of the society that Herzl dreams of being built here in the land of Israel. And it's essentially an ideal European society transplanted into the Middle East, right? Its elite are wearing white gloves to the opera. They speak German and French and they pride themselves on the technologically advanced and socially progressive society that they've built 
all the great ideals that, that, that Herzl had absorbed within elite cosmopolitan European society are now being given their full and sort of appropriate in his eyes form within this alt neu land, this old new land. At the same time, the temple stands at the center of it. Now granted, the temple is not on the Temple Mount because Herzl was smart enough to know that you could just, if you're already messing with history and everything and culture, you don't have to knock down the Dome of the Rock and cause all the thousands of years of conflict that people are worried about. So he just moved the temple, but it's there. He didn't have to put it there at all. He specifically cites the Jubilee cycle, you know, the 57 times seven, we just read about it in last week's Parsha in Bahar, right? As a, as a foundation for the economic structure. And he spends a significant amount of time presenting the Passover Seder in detail within the book as part of it. So there's a tension within the book about whether what he's looking at is indeed just simply a progressive Western European society planted in the Middle East and that accusation against Herzl that he was simply an assimilated, acculturated Jew who for one reason or another just like jumped on the bus of Jewish history. Or he, is he actually envisioning the temples there, they're celebrating Passover, that the Jubilee has actually been revived and is the basis for the economy without getting into the details of rabbinic law, et cetera? Or is he actually struggling to say the, the only way to move forward in Jewish history is to take the past and apply it to the future, right? Now, there were people who loved Alton Land and there were people who hated it. One of its chief critics was Asher Ginsburg. We're, we're gonna know him shortly as Achad Ha'am, which was his Hebrew pen name, meaning one of the people. But Ginsburg wrote a review of Alt Neuland in his um, periodical Hashiloach. And we're gonna, I'm going to tell Ginsburg's story shortly. This is just our narrative hook. Um, and he wrote, and, and, and basically the opening line was, the cat is out of the bag. Because he said that this Zionist leader, remember 1903, we're only six years after the foundation of the Zionist movement. And we'll talk about Ginsburg's reaction to to the first Zionist conference when we get his story. But so it's only six years later, he says, now the Zionist leaders finally revealed his conception of the Messianic age, which is around the corner. And what's that conception? It's not Jewish, says Ginsburg. Not only is it not Jewish, anything which seems to be Jewish, accuses Ginsburg, is basically just window dressing, which is meant to conceal the truth from the ignorant, which is that this new Zion is just Europe in a new location. Right? And in, in Asher Ginsburg's eyes, Herzl was doing the worst possible sin. He was aping the culture of his oppressors who had now become his emancipators. Remember, and, and this is going to lead us when we get to Ginsburg's story to one of the fundamental tensions, which culturally really still exists within Israel today, although the sort of uh, poles have shifted between what was at the time Western European Jewry and Eastern European Jewry. Because Ginsburg represents Eastern European Jewry, where we spoke last week or even two weeks ago with Pinsker about how the cultural um, integrity was far more intact than Eastern Europe because of the solidarity created by, created by oppression. If you remember in the pale, that solidarity that comes from oppression, plus simply the geographic concentration. The, you know, the pale will become 40% of world Jewry. You know, and, and as opposed, and furthermore, they, they, the emancipation that they were experiencing at the end of the 19th century was new as opposed to Western European Jewry who beginning with the French Revolution in 1789, 1791 really with the National Assembly, but were, had begun a process of emancipation which at this point in our story is over a hundred years old, right? So, so these two poles uh, are going to play a very important role. Today, by the way, if you just want to understand, those poles have been replaced really by Ashkenazi versus Sephardi in a lot of the cultural discourse. That the, that the Edot Mizrach, the communities who are descended from those who, who um, left North Africa and the Middle East, will often take the position of having a more sort of deep cultural integrity as opposed to the Ashkenazim, Germans and Eastern Europeans have been lumped together. You know, again, it's broad, gross generalization, but in, in representing a much more European ideal outlook. It's, a, it's a, something which deserves its own discussion. But for our purposes, Ginsburg accuses Herzl of revealing himself in Alt Neuland as doing the ultimate sin, right? He is what, what Ginsburg calls in one of his famous essays that we'll mention, a uh, mental and spiritual slave because he's 
aping the culture of his oppressors who have become his emancipators. So in order to really appreciate the critique, we have to understand the critic. So who was Asher Ginsburg? Asher Svi Ginsburg is born in 1856 in a small town near Kiev, that's in the Pale, of course. His parents are both pious Hasidim and fairly well-to-do. And those two things, of course, are gonna have a major impact on the young boy growing up. He attends Cheder up until age 12. Right, uh, but he branches out quickly, shows himself, it's, this is the classic story, he's a young genius, especially adept at languages, and because his parents are wealthy, they're able to provide him with the private tutors, which are completely unavailable to the vast majority of Jews in Eastern Europe. Remember, in Western Europe, they're already being put into secular sort of German and French-speaking schools. In Eastern Europe, if you want a non, sort of, let's call it a secular education, but it's really a non-Jewish education, then it's gotta be provided to you privately, and, and Asher Ginsburg's father can do so. You know, and the, the story is that after, at eight already, he taught himself to read Russian, and then he masters French, English, and German as well. And this, of course, brings him into the larger world of 19th century uh, emancipation thought, right? And because of that, he loses faith in the traditional Hasidic perspective and lifestyle while he's still an adolescent. And if you recall, I mentioned to you like the sort of, uh, foundational conflict between Hasidut and the Eastern European life, the uh, Eastern European emancipation, the Naskala, right? And, and we didn't really um, flesh it out fully, but for our purposes now, remember the accusation of the masculine, of the enlighteners, was that the Hasidim are obscurantists. It's one of those words which never gets used, but is actually quite accurate. The point being that if you want to live a satisfying life, you have to just obscure the enlightenment knowledge, the critical historical perspective. You have to obscure the fact that we are living in a state of oppression and, and need to take some agency and fix it. And if you're willing to do that, you can fall. You can live a good life. You can have a deep spiritual life. You can have, you can have profound social fabric. You can have a sense of faith and meaning which permeates every aspect of, but say the masculine, you just have to do it by putting blinders on. And that is exactly what the masculine were either unwilling or unable to do. And so at this young age, Ginsburg has the blinders removed through his capacity to read multiple languages. Um, he never really gives up the romanticism, however, which also lies at the heart of classic Hasidic thought. And we're gonna see that that actually has a deep impact on, um, on his story and the brand of Zionism, which he eventually, in many ways, fathers. Um, so, he goes from Hasidut, Hasidut, sorry, in his adolescence to sort of declaring allegiance to the Haskalah, which was at that point by, you know, like the 1860s, already 1860s, 1870s, really at its inflection point amongst Eastern European Jewry. And then his early 30s, he caught the nationalist bug, which, as we saw, was in no way contradictory within the Haskalah to the more enlightened, as Pinsker, we spoke about the fact that he both believed you should be a true son to your people and to the motherland of Russia. So he, that, those things didn't contradict necessarily in his day. He became quite involved in the growing Chibat Zion movement, the Chovei Zion, right, we spoke about, was the precursor to the official Zionist movement. And we spoke about Pinsker's role in really um, uh, bringing that together at the Katowice conference. If you remember in 1884, all these little groups of people who had just declared themselves lovers of Zion, came together in 1884 at Katowice, which is either in Poland or Germany, depending on whether you ask a Pole or a German. Um, the, and, and they had an official conference and created Kivat Zion as a movement, and they elected Pinsker as the president. So Ginsburg was there. He went, but he didn't go as some sort of like starry-eyed follower of Pinsker, some sort of um, uh, romantic nationalist. Um, I see, Avram, you're asking, did he totally reject religion? He rejected ritual life. We'll see that he didn't reject a religious worldview. Um, so he went to Katowice. Ginsburg went nowhere as a starry-eyed follower. And that's the other things you have to know about him. He was the official and self-appointed crank and critic of Eastern European Jewry, right? He went with the um, critical approach that the territorial solution to the Jewish problem was off base. Remember, that was Pinsker's whole thing. Auto emancipation, the Jews are like a ghost amongst the nations. 
The problem is Judeophobia, as he called it. And the solution is to reconstitute ourselves like a people like all others, and then um, we'll be normal, <laughs> as if the Jews could ever hope for such a thing, right? Um, but, but Ginsburg was not buying it. He had his own ways about how you should love Zion and what the solution to the Jewish problem was. In fact, he had a different definition of the problem, as we'll see, right? Um, see, because he didn't think the Jews, first of all, two things. Number one, he didn't think it, the Jewish question, that the solution to the Jewish question depended on seizing some piece of the planet, not even Zion. It was an insufficient answer. Number two, he didn't think that the Jews could be saved piecemeal through sort of like buying one farm here, one farm there, or even through mass colonization, even of that ancient homeland. Why? Because he, despite the fact that he'd left the ritual life behind as Avram asked, right? He still was a chassid in his heart. And he knew, Rahman al boy, right, that God wants the heart. God wants the heart. And if you take a bunch of people who don't know what it means to be a Jew and you drop them in Zion, they're just going to be a bunch of confused people in Zion. They're not going to be a people, right? Um, and he felt that so long as the love of Zion, Chibat Zion, remember he's at the Katowitz conference, right, was seeking its outlet solely in agriculture or building uh, refuges from anti-Semitism, it would never really be an answer to the underlying Jewish question, right? He felt that the focus of the whole Chibat Zion movement because we're before the Zionist conference, should be first and foremost on preparing the hearts of the people for its own nationalities. Now, this is a very big shift. And it's a very important understanding is that Ginsburg is arguably the first person certainly to articulate a program, and he might have really been the first to raise the issue that it's just not a given that the Jews are a nation. I mean, you can speak in idealistic terms. Yes, the Jews are a nation, the Torah calls Am Yisrael and blah, blah, blah. But functionally, Ginsburg says, when you look around at this Jew, that Jew, and that Jew, the Jew in Western Europe, the Jew in Eastern Europe, the Jew who's now moved to North America, et cetera, we don't have any national sentiment. It's not like the Germans who like, you know, you, you, you sing a song and you, you play a marching band, he says, and like, <gasps> there's a whole section of the, of, the, of the society, the culture that starts to, um, ooh, you froze. I get you back? All right, so it's not like other nations in Europe, like the Germans who are the classic nationalist group, where if you play the right song or you quote the right, um, if you play the right song or you quote the right poet, the national sentiment stirs. And the key is, of course, not as an end unto itself, but you can get them to act. Because Ginsburg didn't disagree with the idea of resettling the land of Israel, as we'll see. The problem is, is that if you just drop a bunch of European Jews in the Middle East, they're going to be a bunch of confused European Jews in the Middle East. They're not going to be a people, right? Um, so, so his solution, as I said, is preparing the hearts of the people for its own nationality. What the Jewish people need is what he called a cultural awakening, right? They had to stir the national the spirit. And the primary means for this, as we're going to see, is what's called the Hebrew Renaissance, right? And we'll speak a little bit about his approach to language. So basically at Katowice, 1884, the, the founding conference that brought together all the little bits and pieces of the Chovei Tzion, the Lovers of Zion movement, into a full movement. At Katowice, he really began a, a battle against political Zionism that would last to his dying day and, in fact, continues as a split within Jewish thought today. Right? Political Zionism sees the problem of the Jewish people as anti-Semitism, and therefore the solution is repatriation. Right? And in particular, it kind of splits between pragmatic, which is like, okay, repatriation, but we're going to do it one go at a time, one farm at a time, or sort of classic political Zionism, we're going to get the powers of the world to grant us a large chunk of land. But either way, they identify the problem as anti-Semitism and the solution as repatriation. Cultural Zionism, as it will be called, identifies the problem as assimilation, as acculturation, as a loss of national spirit. Therefore, the solution will be a re revival of national spirit, which, of course, the physical land of Israel is an important component of that, but it's not an end unto itself. There will be others, as you're familiar with labor Zionism and, and, um, and A.D. Gordon, who's coming, et cetera, like, 
and if we had more time, we would speak about everybody. But for now, I want you to appreciate the difference between cultural and political. Um, it, he, you know, Ginsburg continues within the Chibat Sion movement. He even forms his own like secret society that he calls the 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 B'nai Moshe. I think it's called B'nai Moshe. I wrote my notes here. Um, yeah, the B'nai Moshe. You know, it's just such a wonderful issue. I, I love to have this image that you have a small handful of Russian Jews meet, meeting in secret thinking that, that they're going to buy, through propagating their vision of a national spiritual awakening, they're gonna bring redemption, even though it's secular redemption, right? Sounds crazy, right? Except if you listen to the names of the original B'nai Moshe, was, um, you know, Asher Ginsburg himself, Chaim Nachman Bialik, Yehoshua Revnitsky, if you're familiar with him, probably less so, Chaim Weitzman, Mayor Dizengoff. I mean, it may sound crazy, but all those men have names have streets of in Tel Aviv named for them, probably in Jerusalem too. So like, you know, crazy is, but, but um, it's a fairly impressive effort. So the, the B'nai Moshe was really, um, it, it didn't really go anywhere in itself, except when you just look at the membership, but it did have an important um, expression in, in sort of Ginsburg's uh, seminal essay in 1889. Again, this is before Herzl. It's 1889 essay, which is Zulo Aderech. This is not the way. Um, and it's really the essay that transformed Asher Tzvi Ginsburg into Achad Ha'am, this sort of like culture figure that I am one of the people and speaking as one of the people, I'll tell you which is a good way and which is not. Um, he says, for many centuries, the Jewish people sunk in poverty and degradation has been sustained by faith and hope in divine mercy. The present generation has seen the birth of a new and far reaching idea which promises to bring down our faith and hope from heaven and transform both into living and active forces, making our land the goal of hope and our people the anchor of faith. Notice that's Kibatzion, which would become political Zionism. And he's not opposed. He's just worried about the time frame and the fact that the essential flaw of political Zionism, and this is important to appreciate his, one of the big differences between Aharam and, say, Pinsker, Herzl, et cetera. He says, it's the focus on individual well-being as a motivation for building what was destined to be a national home. Now, it's often missed that there's a very sort of bourgeois, almost colonial spirit in early political Zionism. And if you look uh, like uh, in, in both the Jewish state and in Alt Neuland, Hitler, uh, Hitler whoops, <laughs> Herzl is, um, yeah, I know, awkward, awkward uh, Freudian slip there. Uh, Herzl is selling a vision of the good life. And one of the things that Ginsburg will make multiple trips to the early settlements within Ottoman Palestine, sort of like fact-finding missions. He was a person that would never write about something unless he actually knew what he was talking about. Ah, Chaval al-Da'avdin, that we no longer have people who will keep their mouth shut unless they actually know what they're talking about, right? Um, the, the, and, and he went multiple times to, to Ottoman Palestine and came back with the impression that life was miserable and that, that people were being sold a lie, that you were gonna like, sort of like move to the land of Israel and plant some orange groves and live like a king on Arab labor. It's like, it's just not gonna happen. Later, if people are familiar with the, the history of Zionism, there's going to be a complete shift within the pragmatic realm of political Zionism toward labor as an end unto itself, that heal the land and heal yourself, Jewish labor. That's on the horizon. Right now, there's political Zionism and, and there's cultural Zionism and um, the idea that you were gonna sort of catch the wave of immigrants who were fleeing Europe for America. Remember, we talked about the storms in the South from 1871 to 1881 and the vast disruption that from basically from 1881 to 1920, that two million plus Jews leave Europe for America. And a lot of the sense of urgency amongst the early Zionists was like, we want to divert that stream. And just imagine, it's impossible, but just imagine if 2 million Eastern European Jews had fled the Pale Settlement for the land of Israel in pre-World War II. It was really pre-World War I. It was a fundamentally different history, right? But it didn't happen. But it was that urgency to sort of catch that wave, which was, which was then sort of expressed to attempt to sell a colonial dream of like profitable homesteads, lucrative business opportunities, thriving Jewish villages, none of which existed. And so Ginsburg was pointing out, not only is that just dishonest, it's a 
failure because in an attempt to sell individual well-being as a motivation for what needs to be a project of national reawakening. He says, until the Jews awake to themselves as a nation, individual accomplishments will not last. He says, all the laws and ordinances, all the blessing and curses of the law of Moshe, and here, Abraham is a bit of your answer to whether he ceased to be a religious person, right? All the Torah, he says, has one unvarying object, the well-being of the nation as a whole in the land of its inheritance. The happiness of the individual is not regarded. It's often missed, by the way, even by people who say Shema twice a day, that God is not promising you or me that if I do what's right, that the rain will fall and the crops will grow and the sun will shine. God is promising, whatever your theology is, just from a narrative standpoint, God is promising the people. And then he says, the individual Israel is treated as standing to the people of Israel in the relation of a single limb to the whole body. The actions of the individual have the reward in the good of the community. And this is where one to chassid, always a chassid. Once you see this language, that every Jew is a limb of the whole body, right? This is someone who has learned chassidut, who also probably knows Tomer Devorah, the classic sort of moral, ethical, mystic text of Rav Moshe Cordovero. And that's a language he probably took straight from the Torah. But anyway, so, so, verify, so he says the way ahead is not this immediate cultivation of the soil of the land of Israel, but a cultivation of the national soul within the people of Israel. He says, we ought to have made it our first objective to bring about a revival. Inspire men with a deeper attachment to national life and a more ardent desire for national well-being. And at the end of his essay, this is this seminal essay, this is not the way, Zuloa Derech, he throws down the gauntlet and basically declares the entire practical program of Chibat Zion a mistake. He says, this then is the wrong way. The heart of the people, that is the foundation on which the land will be regenerated. And the people is broken into fragments. And then he, he quotes Bamidbar, El-Enu v'lo ata, Ashurenu v'lo karov. Right? He says, I'll see it, but not now. I'll behold it, but not nigh. He knew that you couldn't rush an evolutionary process, and that the revolutionary desire to just uproot the people and plant them in the land of Israel was going to fail. Now, notice he's messianic as well, because if you look at the end of that pasuk, it's a star has gone forth from Yaakov and a, and a, and a staff from Israel. He's, he hasn't given up, he's a chassid at heart, but he has a different sense, not only of pace, but of course of focus and method. Now, if, there's one more piece here before I'll pause for a second and we'll get in a little bit into the, um, the Hebrew Renaissance. The, the, it's important to note that, that Asher Ginsburg was not just, as much as he liked to cast aspersions at his opponents that they were products of non-Jewish thinking, he, of course, was also a product of the enlightened thought of his day. And in the, this idea that culture develops inexorably in an evolutionary process is a hallmark of what's known as social Darwinism. Now, social Darwinism is one of the most influential and least sort of uh, paid attention to, there's probably a better way to say that, um, the streams of, of uh, late 18th, sorry, late 19th, early 20th century thought. Social Darwinism, right? People are familiar with, if I said to you, who, who coined the term survival of the fittest? Most people would tell me Darwin. So it's not clear that Darwin ever said such a term. But Herbert Spencer, the father of social Darwinism, absolutely did. And social Darwinism, in a very simplistic fashion, is, is the application of the ideas of evolution to societies and cultures. And the reason that Spencer puts the emphasis on survival of the fittest is because he had an image of world cultures at war. And that strong cultures survive, weak cultures are destroyed or at least subsumed. And much of the racial theory and the sort of ideological justification for European domination, which will play itself out in the North Americas as well, right, has its roots in Spencer's thought. That being said, he had a few very important ideas that Ginsburg had certainly absorbed, right? Number one, that human societies are a type of organism. By the way, this is not unique to Spencer. If people are familiar with Hegel's thought, was also a very important part of Hegelian thought, but they're the type of organism and they're products of mostly, of slow and mostly unconscious development, right, through which they become more complex and well adapted, that's provided that they survive to become the fittest, right? And furthermore, every society as an interlocking system of all these parts, 
means that if you find one piece and shift it, you can transform the society as a whole. Now, Ginsburg is not interested, so to speak, in the, the, the survival of the fittest, nature, red, tooth and claw, domination stance. He's interested in the question of how do you shift an organism, right? What's the piece in this complex matrix of society, of Jewish culture, that he can shift and therefore push an evolutionary process toward a deeper attachment to national spirit? And the answer he's going to give is language. But I'm gonna pause there, because I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Hebrew um, Renaissance, and then we'll come back to uh, who was his, what we call Bar Plugta, who was his opponent in this process of the new Jew. So um, questions, comments, things you guys want clarified um, or deepened so far in Ginsburg and this idea of cultural Zionism as opposed to political Zionism. You can put them in the chat or people can ask me in the old fashioned way. Yeah. If we can, yeah, okay. Albram. Okay, so is it clear though that he does believe that Palestine is the place to be but that the people have to be changed? He's not yeah. rejecting the yeah, he will come eventually to formulate his approach, which we were going to come to later, but I'll just say it now, as to the land of Israel. Mike, could America. you repeat the question? Yeah, the question was, is it clear that he actually believed that Zion, that the land of Israel, needed to be the center point? Because if you recall, there were other people, Pinsker amongst them, who were what we call territorialists. They just felt like there needed to be some home. Now, Ginsburg is attached to Zion. And he sees it as a natural, a national spiritual center. Ultimately, he develops a whole vision about an elite portion of the Jewish people who will live there and develop the culture, and that will radiate outward, awaken the national spirit amongst the masses. And then eventually he does believe in all the Jews returning to the land of Israel. He's not an opponent to the Zionist project. He's an opponent to political Zionism's mechanism and their identification with, uh, uh, sorry, um, anti-Semitism is the problem and the sense of a rush that that's producing as opposed to assimilation is the problem. It is a much slower, more gradual process to shift the culture than it is to sort of like hold off the bad guys. Uh, Peter and Oviva, you guys had a question there? Yeah, um, Herbert Spencer, his social Darwinism, did that become the, the um, intellectual underpinnings of things like wiping out the American Indian and slavery and eventually the Nazis? Uh, well, first of all, American, American Indians and slavery, it would be post facto. Uh, you know, a lot of that doesn't need an intellectual underpinning. It's just brutal survival. I would say like if Hamistaba, when Spencer looked at the way things have been done, he mm -hmm. said, well, it's clear that European culture is superior because they were able to do these things. But yes, Social Darwinism will become the underpinning for much of what's known as racial theory in the sort of late 19th and into the 20th century, which comes, which itself serves as justification for, for Jim Crow laws in particular, not so much slavery, because slavery had already been in existence for a long, but the Jim Crow laws, this idea that there's a legal justification for the inferiority of African Americans, and therefore they should be kept in a subservient legal position, right? And then ultimately, yes, the eugenics and racial theory of the Nazis will draw quite quite deeply from Spencer. One of the problems is that Spencer also was an incredible social observer and had, I think, personally, very important insights on the natures of societies and their evolution. But um, it, it's similar to the whole question of whether it's like morally repugnant to use the medical information that the Nazis gathered within the camps is also a really deep question. Can you really separate Spencer's observations from the conclusions which were drawn and the reality which it created in the world. That's a longer discussion, but it's worth it. And you're going to see, by the way, the, in Max Nordau, uh, there's going to be some quite resonant elements with, um, with that darker side of Spencer. Okay, other questions, comments before we get yeah. moon? Yeah. Like this view that he had that it had to be evolutionary, not revolutionary, and we have to change the people. Was he not affected by all the pogroms going on in Russia to give him a feeling that, you know, maybe we better rush this a, a little bit? We're going to see that discussion when, it, when, when he argues with Nordau. And of course, he was affected by it. But, but, but he fundamentally felt that the problem, listen, the Jews have been suffering for 2,000 years. With all due respect to the, the pogroms of Russia, they were bad. But, but it wasn't a fundamental shift wasn't the Holocaust, right? And so, and so therefore he felt like the urgency of political Zionism was a little bit self-serving. Again, the way a person who sees every problem, sorry, a person whose only tool is a hammer sees every problem as a nail, right? And so his whole argument 
is that political Zionism has already decided the only solution is to get the Jews physically back to the land of Israel. Therefore, the only real problem is anti-Semitism. Whereas he sees the solution as reawakening the national spirit and he identifies the problem as assimilation. Yeah, Israel. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you know the answer, but I'm curious to why he went to London before he came to Palestine. I, I don't know. Don't know. Um, no, I mean, listen, these guys all traveled around. I mean, they were complex individuals attached to many cultures. That's, I mean, there's a cosmopolitan element even in Akhad Am, I would say. Okay, other, other, um, other questions or comments, clarifications before we, we get back in the flow? Okay, if people, something comes up, don't be shy to write it down in the, in the chat stream. I'll try to relate to it as I can. So, so like I said, it, within Spencer's thought, this idea that every society, every culture, if you will, is an, inter, uh, is a, is an organism of interlocking parts. And, and that if you could figure out which one is the proper lever that you could actually shift the culture, and in Akhada Am's case, you could awaken this national spirit that he was after, um, led him to the conclusion that language is the keystone component of culture. And he was not alone in this. We've mentioned several times that language plays a critical role in late 19th century philosophy, certainly in, in romantic nationalism, right? Um, and so he's certainly not only Akhada Am, but like just one of the world at this point in that sense. Um, because you know, no matter how heterogeneous a society is, if they share a language, then they share some commonality of concepts and values that draws them together. And, and so he wrote, in fact, a very important observation, in my humble opinion, that language functions by processing experience on an unconscious level and making it available on a conscious one. It's an important point I just want to clarify for my own purposes, that the primary sort of function of language is not communication, it's conceptualization. That, 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 and, and therefore, language is way more than a technical tool for establishing connection between people or delivering information. It is the way in which we construct our world. So therefore, if we want to live in the same world, which is his goal, we must share a same language, right? Um, I mean, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of observations here. I mean, I'm not going to get totally into it. Let's let's talk history. Um, that that uh, it's together with this. Haram is a deep believer from the Hegelian and certainly Spencer's standpoint that um, every nation has an essential nature, which is meant to find sort of expression through its evolutionary process, and therefore the language that a nation has is not just a record of its development but it is the repository of its national spirit. And there's Hegel, if people are familiar with him, sort of in his classic form. And therefore a people that ceases to use its language for everyday usage, for their collective engagement of the world as, as it were, they don't just, they don't lose their literature. That's written down in books on shelves, right? And, but what they lose is sort of the living nerve cells of memory, that ability to connect the past into the present that gives you some sense of guidance for the future. And that's what Akhara Am is after. He's after a, a, the ability to sort of speak our world into being together, not as German Jews, French Jews, American Jews, but as Israel, right? Bialik, who was arguably one of his chief students or disciple, probably a better way to say it. He says the following in his uh, great, uh, by the way, a wonderful essay called Language Pains by Bialik. I enc highly encourage you to read. It says a truly living language is produced by life and life's literature. It does not detain its offspring in the womb, rather is fruitful and multiplies constantly and of itself, releasing creative power in its due season. A truly dead language has nothing but the writing on tombstones, work done by the stone cutter at a time of dire need. Not so our language, now he's speaking about Hebrew, a pseudo living language that gives birth to very little and leaves much tucked in her womb. It is our role to induce the birth. And this in many ways expresses this dilemma that, that these poets of what's called the Hebrew Renaissance really felt. Haram wasn't a poet, he was an essayist, but Nachman uh, Bialik, um, uh, Shaul Tchernikovsky, right? they, they were struggling with this sense that they didn't have a language within which they could articulate their present day experience. One, one of the ways that you could look at this is, um, 
I have here a quote from uh, Chernikovsky. Well, if you're familiar with the, the history of Hebrew literature, Chernikovsky is a difficult figure. He's a difficult figure. People look at, some people look at him as a, as a hero of Hebrew literature because he freed it from his particularism. Some people see him as a traitor because he introduced like non-Jewish conceptual frameworks and ideas into Hebrew literature. But, but Chernikovsky says, I, a mute person will stand and listen. What is for me? Who is for me? A foreigner, a stranger in their world. A foreigner only narrowly plotting my path. His experience is he's a stranger in the non-Jewish world. But he's only narrowly plotting his path because the language he wants to use to become himself is so underdeveloped. You, uh, you know, in, in, in that same essay, what he, he speaks about is that what it's like to grow up as a poet, commanding a language which can describe the temple in Jerusalem, which has a complex angelology and can tell you about the habits of demons, but has no words for the trees he's looking at in the forest around him. It, it can't describe the undergrowth that he's walking through. Just think about the sense of alienation there. That if, if he wants to reach back into an ancient mythic past, he has a rich vocabulary. If he wants to experience the present, he's got to be a foreigner to himself. And of course, he's seen as a foreigner to the native speakers of that language. That sense of alienation is exactly where Acharam is going to push. He's going to push on it deeply through his classic periodical Hashiloach. But if we're really going to talk about the Hebrew Renaissance, I should probably give credit where credit is due and um, at least recall, of course, Eliezer Yitzchak Perlman, who is also known as, come on, folks, Eliezer Ben Yehuda. Eliezer Ben Yehuda. So, so this is the time, and we're bringing in a lot of, of uh, personalities here, so, so I don't want to lose the general picture. We're talking about the new Jew. Right? right, the political Zionist said the new Jew Shmuju, what do I care about that right now? We need, we need to just get the Jews we got and put them, get them safe and put them into the land of Israel or frankly into Uganda or some piece of territory. Granted, in the end of the day, they were committed to Zion as Zionism, but, but not as a, as a sort of a redemptive vision, but rather as a pragmatic approach to solving the problem of anti-Semitism. Ahad Am has a sense Oh, someone asked how to get the name Achad Am. That's what he called himself. That was his pen name. Um, Achad Am the, says, no, no, no. That'll never work as an end unto itself. The problem is assimilation. And the solution, therefore, is awakening the national spirit. And we have to create a new Jew, a Jew that has learned to speak his native language, and therefore, by reaching into the roots of his linguistic past, can create a present which will get us to the future we want. And, and he himself benefited directly from the efforts of, of, of a titanic individual in the history of the Hebrew language, which is Eliezer ben Yehuda. So briefly, because I don't want to sort of like lose the string, just, you know, he was born in 1858, Eliezer ben Yehuda. He was born as Eliezer Yitzhak Perlman in Belarus, once again to a Hasidic family, much like Asher Tzvi Ginsburg, like Achad Am. And like Achad Am, he began his education in, in the world of tradition, and of course, encountered the enlightenment. Actually for him, it was his Rosh Hashiva, who was a secret enlightener, who like started slipping him all these sort of like, like you know, sort of uh, secret philosophical works. Um, he eventually learns Russian, which frees him in many ways. He goes on to, of course, to marry his, his tutor, right? Young Jewish woman who taught him Russian, marries his tutor. Um, he wakes up at a certain point to the nationalist spirit. Again, I'm just showing the arc of so many of these people. And because he wakes up to the nationalist spirit, he realizes that the Hebrew language is the only way that we will become a people again. You know, and, and unlike most of the other characters of the Hebrew Renaissance, he picks up and he moves to Israel. Right? He says that basically there's only one way that we'll ever be a, a, a people again, and language is the means for national redemption. And the, the land of Israel will become a center for the entire people, right? And the only way to make that happen is to immigrate. In 1881, very early in the story, Eliezer ben Yehuda moves to the land of Israel. He becomes, to, he gets to Jerusalem, right? He changes his name to Eliezer ben Yehuda once he gets there. And um, basically swore together an oath with his wife never to speak anything other than Hebrew in their home. Right? So all kinds of crazy stories about him. His children were the, arguably the first sort of like um, Hebrew-speaking kids, uh, you know, solely Hebrew-speaking kids 
you know, for, for quite some time, had no one to play with because he wouldn't let anyone who didn't speak Hebrew to them play with them. And he was this crazy character who, who, who grew peyote and, and dressed in traditional garb so that he could go to the, to the different yeshivot and Bati Midrashot in Jerusalem to try to clarify the meaning of, of words. He was consumed by this idea that the rebirth, notice, he didn't, he didn't create the Hebrew language. He wanted to, to rebirth it as a vernacular. And that's critical. Just remember Chernikovsky. And that's when people speak about Hebrew. And, and Hebrew was a, was a living language in its day. People, you know, Jews from Germany who wanted to communicate with Jews from Yemen or, or you know, like that, it was a, a language in which there was a cross-cultural. But, but the, most of that communication wasn't about the world in which we live. It was reaching into the roots of our past to find some means of communication. Chernikovsky could describe the angels and he could describe the temple. He couldn't talk about the forest he lived in unless he was made himself a foreigner to his own tongue. So, so Ben Yehuda goes back. People saw through his disguise. They knew he was a heretic. But nevertheless, he was tolerated in Jerusalem, apparently, even though at one point he was excommunicated. But his efforts bore fruit. He killed him, by the way. He dies of, of quite young of tuberculosis, right? Um, in 1910, he began the publication of a dictionary, which in the end was a 17-volume set of the complete dictionary of ancient and modern Hebrew didn't finish until well after his death, but he created the Academy of Hebrew Language, which still exists today. Um, and he dies in 1922, only one month after the British authorities actually declared Hebrew to be the official language of the Jews of Palestine, which was not a small feat. If we were going to tell the whole story going forward, the fact that Hebrew actually became the official language of what was known as the Yishuv, the Jewish settlement in, in then British mandatory Palestine, was not a given by any means. Um, so let's get back to Hanaham. I just, again, I just wanted to throw that in there as a, as a sense of the importance of Hebrew Renaissance because we can't do everything. But if we're going to talk about the new Jew, you can't put too much emphasis on the rebirth of the Hebrew language. So, so actually, just pause since I raced through a massive part of Zionist history in the, in the, in the Hebrew Renaissance. I'll pause before I keep racing ahead um, for questions, comments, clarifications about the importance of language here. And I want, the emphasis, the piece I want you to take is that, that language is not just a means for communication, it's a means for conceptualization. It's the way in which we know our world. And so therefore, if you want to take people from disparate cultures, uh, disparate life experiences, disparate national arcs, and awaken a national spirit and fight assimilation, which Akadaham saw to be the primary problem, there's no greater tool than language. Okay, questions, comments before we encounter yet another personality. All right, either you're overwhelmed or we're doing well. I'll never really know, will I? No, I just had to unmute. It wasn't my space bar wasn't working. What the political Zionists, when they talk to each other in meetings or more generally, what language were they using? Likely German. I mean, it depends on where they were, but, 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 but German was perhaps the most widely you know, spoken language amongst them. And in Eastern Europe, it would be Russian? Likely Russian, although a lot of them spoke Yiddish as well. Yiddish, okay, right. Israel. Israel, are you there? You had a question? A comment? Do you know when and why he was... Ex yeah, yeah. Do you know when and why he was excommunicated? Uh, it was, I mean, he arrived in Israel after 1881. He was, he was, he was put under the van because he, he, was a, he was a Moscow. He wasn't living a religious life. He was pretending. He looked religious, but he wasn't Shomer Shabbat. He wasn't, you know, you know, Etc. So, like, they, he was a dangerous, undermining character. When exactly it happened, I don't have the date here. Um, other questions, comments? Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna move ahead. I got about twenty five minutes. And again, what I want you to to sort of be taking is this broad picture of of a need to transform linguistically, and not just physically, a cultural awakening in which, by the way, that the, the future which emerges isn't necessarily a continuity, well, it's a continuity with the past, but not necessarily a linear one. Okay, so let's go back to the first Zionist Congress. Um, so, you know, because Achad Am didn't just uh, serve as the official crank of the Katowitz Conference, remember that founding conference of the Chovei Zion. He went, of course, to the first Zionist Conference as a delegate from the Chovei Zion. And in his own words, for the three days of rejoicing, he was like a mourner at a wedding feast. Right? Why? 
because the, the focus on physical salvation of political Zionism was a failure from the get-go. He'd been fighting it since the early days of the Chibat Zion movement. And he called Herzl a false messiah who had somehow enchanted the Jews in the same way that Shabtai Tzvi had done only 200 years before him. Ah, so those are fighting words, by the way. Um, he, he writes, just like he wrote, this is not the way, Zulu Aderech, after the Katowitz conference, after the Basel conference, the first Zionist Congress, right, uh, 1897. Um, so he, uh, so uh, Haram writes an essay called The Jewish State and the Jewish Problem. And he says, only a fantasy bordering on madness can believe that so soon as the Jewish state is established, millions of Jews will flock to it and the land will afford them adequate sustenance, right? He says, land acquisition is a distraction. A national bank is just financial small-mindedness. The idea that the consent of the nations needed to be gained was irrelevant. In his eyes, tangible goals are not what builds a people. But this is critical to understand. And, and by the by, the proof of the matter is that until the Holocaust and the War of 48, which caused the expulsion of all the Edo de Mizrach, all the Jews of the North African Middle East, the vast majority of Jews not only didn't come to Israel, they were opposed to coming to Israel. And this is exactly what Haram warned about. He said that if, if you create it, they will, they will not necessarily come. This whole, if you build it, they will come. He says, no, the, 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 there has to be some awakening of a national spirit that people then see this as a means for the embodiment and the pro progress. Remember, he's looking for evolution. Political Zionists are, are trying to solve a problem. He wants to, to realize a national ideal. So um, there are plenty more Zionist congress, congresses, sorry, after the first one, Aharam never returns. He never goes back, right? However, um, he does have a group of followers within the Zionist movement who uh, form sort of an informal opposition to Herzl. That's basically like being against the Messiah. Um, they call themselves the Democratic Faction, which find its rebirth in modern left-wing Israeli politics, if you're following the name, it's very interesting. Um, the, the, and one of its leaders is young Chaim Weitzman, who will go on to be not only a critical leader of the Zionist movement, of course, but the first future president of Israel. So meaning, Afalam's voice, he himself is gone, but his voice is quite loud. Um, and they will push his vision from within the Zionist Congress, advocating basically that the whole goal that, um, to the land of Israel would come first Jewishness and then the Jews. And that's if you want to like, like sort of like understand his relation to the physical project of Zionism as well as the cultural project is that to the land of Israel will come first Jewishness and then the Jews, right? Um, and he says until in his words, after several generations, it will have achieved its goal. The creation in the land of Israel of a national spiritual center for Jewishness that is loved by the entire Jewish people and binds it together. Notice the center of knowledge, and here's part of your answer too, Abraham, a center of Torah study of the Hebrew language and its literature of the purest of bodies and souls, a true miniature of the Jewish people as it should be, right? And um, it's interesting that Haram is seen, you know, like political Zionism succeeded, Haram, you know, failed, et cetera. If you think about the struggles of what the, what the state of Israel is trying to do today, who are we meant to be in relationship to world Jewry? His ideas, with plenty of caveats and criticisms, et cetera, but his ideas, in my humble opinion, are more relevant today than ever. Because today we actually have a thriving physical state, and the question which plagues us is what to do with it. What does it mean? How is it an expression of a greater sort of progress of Jewish vision? However you understand progress, right? I, I, I really believe that most people are progressive in their own way. They just have a difference on, on what we're trying to get to. Um, the most, not all. Uh, the more heavily invested you are in the current situation, probably the less progressive you are, but that's a different discussion. So um, the, but, but this idea that to the land of Israel will come first Jewishness and then the Jews, in, in all fairness, Herzl wasn't necessarily opposed to this. In his keynote speech at Basel, the first Zionist Congress, he had said, we've returned home as it were. Zionism is a return to Jewishness even before there's a return to the Jewish land, right? Um, but Haram just called him out and he said, Herzl doesn't, even if he meant that, and it wasn't just propaganda, which it might've been, might've just been him like, you know, there were a lot of religious delegates at the Basel conference who saw Herzl as a dangerous figure. 
But even let's 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 be down the kaf schut, as we say. Let's judge him favorably. But Hanam's whole point was that Herzl doesn't know what it means to be a Jew. He's a product of the what he calls the the um, mental slavery. Remember that their oppressors have become their emancipators out there in Western Europe, and therefore they are trying to just imitate the freedom and enlightened emancipated culture, which first oppressed and then emancipated them. Whereas a Hanam wants to figure out what it really means to be a Jew. Now, Herzl was pretty hurt by a Hanam's criticism, both in the wake of the first, uh, first Zionist Congress, and then in the wake of the publication of Alt Neuland. But he knew that um, his status as a leader was only going to be undermined if he sort of entered into a literary struggle with him. Not out of fear of losing, but you know, a, a leader should not descend into conflict. You should accept criticism and, and, and move on. Wait, Marsha, are you raising your hand there? If you have a question that would help me, if you could just, um, the, if you could uh, just write it down there. If you could just write, unless there's something that, I, that you didn't understand. If you have a question, it's helpful if you could write it down. Um, the, so, so, but even though a leader shouldn't just descend into sort of like, like in slinging mud, um, nevertheless, the Hanam's criticisms needed to be answered. So Herzl turned to the last character we're going to meet in the last 15 minutes, which has plenty of time, I think, to end one more element of this new Jew. He turned to Max Nordau in order to answer Ahad Am's criticism. Now, um, Nordau was, his, was Herzl's first convert and was a literary big gun. He was, in personality, the biggest personality at that first Zionist conference. So he was bringing out this sort of heavy artillery in order to fight a Hadam. So I'm gonna tell you who Max Nordau was and a little bit about what he represents in this quest for the new Jew. But before I do, there were a couple people I asked to, um, to, to pause. But quickly, please, real clarification, because we only have about 17 minutes. Were there things that people missed? Marsha, I asked you to wait. So you, you get the first shot. I, I don't, uh, you said Chaim Weizmann was actually a supporter of of uh, Haram. Haram. For sure. Then didn't he eventually become the uh, political Zionist, the, like the, the symbol of political Zionism? He, yes, political Zionism, although, I mean, people like Jabotinsky will claim that actually he betrayed Herzl. That's a, that's a whole longer discussion of what happens to political Zionism. Nordau and Jabotinsky feel that Chaim Weizmann No, was, I'm saying was, Chaim no, Weizmann. Yes, yes, but my point is that that is the way the story is told by Chaim Weizmann and his disciples. But the, the revisionists, the sort of counter narrative of Zionist history, see Chaim Weizmann as having betrayed the fundamental principles of political Zionism. That's a longer discussion I can't get into. But, so your, but your, okay. your question is yes, and there's a lot more to that story. Um, okay, thank you. Are you. Not, you are not incorrect. It's just there's one narrative in conflict with another there. Other clarifications, things people want to ask or say? Okay. So, so who was Max Nordau and why does he matter for our story of the new Jew? And why did Herzl Davka pull out the big guns from him? So Nordau was born at Simcha Sudfeld. That's a big switch from Simcha Sudfeld to Max Nordau. Right? He's born um, in 1849 in the city of Pest. He's a few years before Herzl. Um, and his father was an Orthodox Jew and Hebrew poet, a rare combination in those days. But he's, again, he's part of this, this um, sort of Hebrew Renaissance, which is just starting to bubble at the time. Like Herzl, Norso gets his early education in Jewish elementary school, but he moves on to a Catholic grammar school and eventually to medical school at the University of Budapest in 1872, which is pretty early for a Jew to be graduating. Um, he, so in the classic story, Simchat Sudfeld changes his name, flees his home city, starts to travel Europe, making a living as a journalist. In 1880, he settles in Paris where he actually remains until World War I. Um, and in, replaced, in, in place of the traditional worldview in which he'd been raised, he, and then abandons, Nordau takes upon himself this pan-European cultural assimilationism as his heritage. He's polylingual. He's liberated from what he sees to be not only his own traditionalist past, but the patriotism of bourgeois society, as he calls it. He defines himself as an intellectual He's a citizen of the world. He's certainly not a Jew, right? He lives by practicing medicine, but his real passion is as cultural critic. And that's how he gains his name. In 1883, 
Nordau drops a bomb on Europe or in cultural Europe with uh, a work called the, the Conventional Lies of Our Civilization. I've been thinking that a similar book needs to be written today, although I don't think anybody would be surprised. But then in 1883, um, he, was, he was living in, in Europe, I'm mean, sorry, in Paris at this point. Um, in 1883, he writes this book. The, 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 the table of contents says it all. It says um, the lie of religion, the lie of monarchy and aristocracy, the political lie, the economic lie, the matrimonial lie, right? The importance and abuse of power of the press, et cetera, et cetera. You get the point, right? He just basically opens up on every social institution that exists. And by 1890, he'd become a household name, right? His books were in scores of editions, dozens of language, critic, philosopher, novelist, you name it, sociologist, he is everything. And his primary critique was his belief that modernist culture that was captivating Europe was a sign of decay and not growth. Um, oh, thank you, Peter, for that insight. I didn't actually know that. Um, the, the, uh, so, so to Nordau, at this stage of his life, science is the highest of human endeavors. He is a true social Darwinist in that the development of civilization is, a pro is the process by which man furthers life of rational unity with his fellow human beings. And frankly, he believes that if any society sticks it out, they basically become in enlightened Europe. At this point, he sees enlightened Europe, not the decay he sees in modernity, as the end goal of human society. He's certainly not a nationalist. At this stage, he's a cosmopolitan, which means that the unit of measure for society is the individual. I have a bunch of great quotes from him, but nevertheless, he comes into our story um, in 1895. At this point, he's a well-known cosmopolitan uh, social critic. He's also a psychologist. Where does he come into our story? Because one of Herzl's friends, who's a little worried after the Jewish state has been published, and Herzl seems to be somewhat unbalanced at this point, read on fire and completely consumed by his ideas and perhaps nuts, so Ursel's friend recommends he goes to see Nordau and see if Nordau will take him on as a patient. Because he needs some rest and perhaps get some balance back. But the story goes that instead of recommending a cure, right, that after three days of conversation and argument, Nordau says to Herzl, if you're insane, then we're insane together. You can count on me. Now again, is that, did that actually happen? There's a whole argument amongst historians. But the point is, is that it, once they meet, Nordau becomes Herzl's almost overnight biggest convert. He helps him organize the first Zionist Congress. He gives the secondary keynote speech as certainly a world famous personality, right? Um, and he's the one who picks up the pen against the Chada Am in defense of political Zionism. Now, the, the conversion element here is quite profound to go from sort of European cosmopolitan intellectual to budding Jewish nationalists. He never really gives up. And, succeeds in totally reconciling between his cosmopolitanism and his nationalism. A lot of it really just is summed up in the reply he gives to his critics who love to throw up his anti-nationalist, previous anti-nationalist stance into his face. He basically says, go tell it to Romanian and Russian Jews and they'll answer, but we have to eat somehow. Meaning he's become a believer and Nordau writes in 1911, very, very alarmingly about the imminent catastrophe which he sees coming to German Jewry. In, in ways in which are just, in 2020 hindsight and all, but are, are just downright frightening. But for our story, Nordaus points out that he sees Achad Am as a narrow-minded, bigoted nationalist, because Achad Am is all about the Jewish spirit and the intrinsic, and he accuses Achad Am as wanting to recreate a ghetto within the land of Israel. Notice the, it's like, the, you know, Nordau doesn't want the new Jew to be a reawakening of the old Jew, a repackaging of this Hasidic spirit, teaching Torah, etc. He wants the new Jew to be a cosmopolitan citizen of the world, but a world which is broken into nations, a people like any other. And so therefore he accuses Zechad Am of, of a retrograde instinct, that, that if assimilation is the problem, we have to become more Jewish, that he basically is accusing Zechad Am of worshiping the, um, of worshiping the ghetto. But for our, that's the narrative conflict between them. And you can imagine that the two of them wrote pretty stunningly against each other. But the last piece I wanna to touch here, and it's, and it's a, a perhaps most profound part of the new Jew 
which has a deep effect on our culture today, um, is an idea that Nordau first introduces at the Second Zionist Congress in August of 1898. He invents a term, he says that Zionism awakens Judaism to new life. He's echoing Achad Am a little bit and achieves this morally through the rejuvenation of the ideas of the Volk. That's that he actually uses that notion of this national spirit and corporally, I mean physically, through the physical rearing of one's offspring in order to create a lost muscular Judaism once again. That Nordau becomes an advocate and he writes further, the first sort of complete expression of this idea is in an article in the Jewish Gymnastics Journal, who knew there was such a thing at the time, right? It was, it was the central sort of uh, literary organ of the Bar Kokhba Gymnastics Association. He writes, history is our witness that such once existed, but for long, all too long, we've engaged in the mortification of our flesh, right? He says, I'm expressing myself imprecisely. It was others who practiced mortification on our flesh and with the greatest success, evidenced by the hundreds of thousands of Jewish corpses in the ghetto, Jewish squares, highways of medieval Europe. In the narrowness of the Jewish street, our poor limbs forgot how to move joyfully. In the dimness of our sunless homes, our eyes developed a nervous blink. That what we need is a muscular Judaism. He goes on to praise Bar Kokhba as a person who was willing to either come home carrying his shield or carried on it, right? Which is an old Greek expression of like either win or die in battle, right? He, he, he praises the name of the choice of this gymnastic association, it's the Bar Kokhba Association. And he says, Bar Kokhba was a hero who refused to suffer any defeat. And when victory was denied to him, he knew how to die. And he was the last embodiment, listen to this, in world history of a battle-hardened and bellicose Judaism. Battle-hardened and bellicose Judaism is what you have in Israel today. Love it, hate it. You need to understand that it was Max Nordau from a philosophical perspective who realized that without muscular Judaism, neither cultural Judaism nor, sorry, not, neither cultural Zionism or, or political Zionism would ever work. Because whatever your vision was, you needed to fight for it in the world. And it was, it was Norda who basically single-handedly revives Bar Kokhba. He doesn't just revive him. He, uh, he sort of redeems and regen he, he regenerates him. And Bar Kokhba today, for many people, is seen as a national hero. That his whole Zionist educational approach to Bar Kokhba as a national hero, that's not how the Gemara looks at him. You read the Ushalmi, he is not a good person, right? And, and yet it's Norda who begins a process of placing Bar Kokhba as a central figure in, in Zionist thought. Muscular Judaism, right? He's looking for, uh, uh, he says, without a generation of physically fit, nationally minded and militarily oriented Jews, that any territory that the world powers grant us is gonna be lost to the brutal nature of the time. And the reality is that one of the questions about the new Jew, which needs to be asked, is how is it possible that within the space of one generation, that, you can, that the Jews as a people can go from being fuel for the ovens of Europe to defeating the combined armies of the Arab world and liberating the city of Jerusalem, whatever you may think about what comes after in politics, et cetera, that simple fact in less than 20 years to undergo that transformation wasn't because Max Nordau said we need a muscular Judaism. He understood that, that again, political Zionism, which saw anti-Semitism as the problem and repatriation as the solution, or cultural Zionism, which saw assimilation as the problem and the reawakening of the national spirit as the solution, Neither of them would have any reality in the world to Nordau without a muscular Zionism, a muscular Judaism that was truly a process of re-embodiment. And I got news for you that, um, that uh, the sense of shame and even loathing that many of the sort of uh, secular, more military-minded, physically oriented, whether it was the, the um, part of this movement which engaged in the labor movement of the, of the early 20th century, or whether it's the more military elements of it, 
by the mid 20th century and sort of like the 1950s, et cetera, right? The, the very difficult relationship which exists to this very day between the Israeli secular military structure and the embodiment of the old Jew in the Haredi world, much of it has its roots in these conflicting images of, is there a new Jew, which is a necessary element for the reconstruction of the Zionist project? And this new Jew speaks Hebrew, is, is muscular, has an awakened national spirit, and has been physically embodied in the land, right? Under his own agency, right? Or, or actually, is that a deviation from the path of Torah and mitzvot and service of God and a, a relinquishing of the process of redemption to where it, so to speak, rightfully belongs in, in the hands of God and the Messiah. Can you hear me? Right? Um, you can hear that, that and at this point, there's three minutes left and I feel like um, though there's a lot at the end, I just want you to appreciate all these elements of a struggle to create a new Jew in many ways are much more foundational than the physical, or sorry, philosophical questions of um, I mean, like how should it best be done or what's the ideal? And this is the place where Nordau has much more impact in many ways than any other thinker of his day. He understood that whatever your ideas may be, if you're not willing to carve out the space and fight for it in the world, certainly in the day in which he stood, then, then you will never see them reach fruition. So I'm gonna stop there. I really appreciate you guys' focus and attention and the, and the hard work that's been done in this whole series. Um, it, just to remind everyone that the series is all up and online on Pardes's wonderful LMOD platform. So if you didn't get to hear some of the earlier classes or you want to listen to them again, all you got to do is, is just to click away. I'm sure Deborah, who's here with us now, once again, is more than happy to help you with information. And thank you, everybody.